Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to another uh, webinar of the Media Education Lab. Uh, I'm specifically excited uh, about uh, this one that started as a conversation uh, between me and Alistair when um, he contacted me and I uh, wanted to interview us and we were talking. I'm like, okay, but can you explain to me what you're doing? And then, ooh, this is so interesting. Like nobody's talking about that. And we definitely haven't talked about that topic um, in any of our series. So that's where I uh, invited. And I promise you that we didn't plan to be in uniform today, uh, Alistair and I, it just, as we started, we're like, oh, cool. You have the same shirt. Okay. Nice. Um, so anyway, I'll let Alistair start and introducing himself and the project. We're gonna talk um, like, Alistair is going to talk for 30 minutes. We're going to go to breakout rooms, then we're going to come back, and then we'll have time for questions and sharing as we usually do. So, Alistair, take it away. Cool. Um, you should have got the orange glasses as well, then we really would have matched. That's what it is. That's what it is. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alistair at uh, Ali, please. Uh, only my nan calls me Alistair. And only on a good day. Most of the time, she calls me Andrew. So. <laughs> So um, I I run the the Safety Net podcast. Uh, I, I'm British. Uh, I'm autistic and ADHD. Um, I have a bachelor's of education, and I have more than three years' experience working with autistic teenagers in deprived communities. Um, specifically, I work with or have worked before this role with autistic teenagers who attend mainstream school. I'm a I'm a firm believer in inclusive of education. Um, so I, I've deliberately chosen to work in schools with higher pupil premium rates. That means uh, students in the UK that are eligible for free school meals. Um, so students from impoverished backgrounds, um, particularly uh, in recent years with um, Islam community, the Islam community here. Um, at the moment, uh, I'm a media literacy trainer, a trainer at the Brain Charity, uh, which is a British neurological nonprofit based in Liverpool. And I, I am the, the creator I suppose, a mastermind um, behind the safety net program, um, which is what I, I'm here to talk to you guys about, because my um, one of my special interests is autism and radicalization, uh, which is, is a disaster, in my opinion, and, and something that needs to be talked about more, um, but isn't for a wide variety of reasons, which we'll get into. Um, there is a degree of controversy here. Um, we will be talking about delicate topics, so, you know, contact warnings. So, what is the Safety Net Project? So the Safety Net Project was provided funding through Ofcom. Uh, Ofcom are the British communications regulatory body. So if you want to show something on a British television channel, um, Ofcom are the organization, the Office of Communications that the government pay um, to regulate that. Uh, in recent years, Ofcom have been branching out more towards the internet. Um, bit late, but they, they're getting there. And and they've decided to give 18 charities in the UK media literacy training funding for 12 months. So initially, the charity I work for applied for this funding before I worked for them. And in our initial bid, it says that we would deliver safety training to dementia care home residents. Yet nobody wants this. <laughs> so we're at a unique crossroads where the thing that we were funded to do is something that isn't actually needed. And, and we spent three months banging our heads against the walls. I called every single uh, dementia care home in the entirety of the northwest of England. You know, I was prepared to drive two hours, which is a long way in the UK. Um, and, and, and what happened is there were no signups. Nobody wants this training. So I decided to pivot away from this. So I created a two hour session which focuses on autism and radicalization, conspiracy theories and online grooming as a concept, um, because that's something that I am interested in myself. Um, the only snag there and for anyone that's ever sought funding here will say this is I had to convince my funders to let me do this. Um, I, I can thankfully say that they were very, very open to it. Um, but what it means is that my program is unlike any other in the UK. Um, because Ofcom would not give funding for this training. Never in a million years. It just happens that I've pivoted from the initial 
request for funding and they've been okay with it. Um, I have no idea why. I'm very fortunate. So what did I create my program to do? So due to the uniqueness of this funding, this is the only training program of its kind in the UK. There are almost no training programs covering the Manosphere or online hate groups, and there is none, apart from my own, that cover autistic spectrum disorders and online hate movements. So far, we've looked at, we've, I've trained 155 people. Um, the vast majority of those, as you'll see, are providers of education and support for autistic young people. Um, the NHS, which is the, the British medical organization here, have been by far um, the biggest uh, recipient of that training. Um, I've taught the entirety of the autism team in Liverpool. So if you seek an autism diagnosis, you've uh, you've obtained my training. Uh, the, the people talking to you will have obtained my training. And I've gone to a lot of uh, additional needs colleges and support networks, organizations and schools. Um, I'm delivering an entire school CPD to Liverpool's largest school tomorrow, which will be 85 members of staff. Um, so it, it's clear that there's a need for this. It's clear that everyone is reaching out for this. Um, and, and so far, as I've said here, we've had 100% positive feedback received. What is the program? What am I talking about? I'm talking about autism and hate. So last year, the UK government, this is from an article in The Guardian on the right. Um, the citation is from the UK government. Um, which stated that there were a staggeringly number of aut of high autistic of autistic people on the UK Prevent Scheme. What's the Prevent Scheme? So, in the UK, if you're a teenager and you are susceptible to radicalization, so you've been radicalized, and you show terroristic activity, then you then your your doctor or most often your school teachers and social worker will refer you to the Prevent Scheme. Um, it's a police intervention program. It is not a program that takes into account neurodivergence at any point in the findings for interventions or in the interventions themselves. It is not placed. So the estimate is around 53% of all teenagers on the Prevent Register are autistic. This is staggeringly high over proportion of how many of us there are. Then if we consider the failure rates of autism diagnosis in the UK. So for context, in the UK right now, if you were to seek a free autism diagnosis, you're looking at a four year wait. If you don't live in North Yorkshire, if you live in North Yorkshire, which is a very rich area of the UK, if you live in North Yorkshire, unless you are suicidal, you are not allowed an autism diagnosis. They have closed the waiting list completely. And it would appear that other counties will go this way. It looks like Wiltshire might also go this way in the next few months. But that's what I'm hearing. That's the scuttlebutt, to use an American phrase. Um, so we, we're clearly looking at an issue that's completely unrecognized. One of the th there's a there's a great quote um, from one of the UK's police uh, police commissioners. So one of the top police uh, officers in the UK who said that we need to talk about autism. That was his quote. That was his entire quote in regards to autism. Just that we need to talk about autism and terrorism. That's the full quote. Uh, he has not spoken about it since. It's been a year and a half. Clearly, the police recognise that there is an issue here. And and for the podcast which Yonti, uh, which I interviewed Yonti for uh, um, a month ago, which will go live in the next few weeks, uh, it'll be our first episode, I have also interviewed a local police commissioner who has cited it specifically on the podcast. She talks about the issues they're seeing in Liverpool with autism and terrorism. There's a quote here from The Guardian, which is a, a UK paper, that says, Police revealed that more than one in ten terrorist suspects arrested in the UK is now a child, and that most are linked to right-wing extremism. So it's important that when we're talking about terrorism, we look at the whole spectrum of terrorism. But in the UK, there appears to be a focused far-right movement. This has always existed in the UK. I see an England flag and I shudder because I associate the England flag with skinhead movements and National Front movements. This is Lloyd Gunton. And I always use this picture of Lloyd Gunton because I think he's a good example of a system that's failed, to be quite frank. 
Lloyd Gunton, who's autistic, was jailed for a life sentence. That means he's not eligible for parole for 11 years. 2029, he'll be eligible for parole. He um, he took a claw hammer and a knife in his backpack, and he wrote a jihadi manifesto, as the judge called it, um, and was researching concerts. Uh, the argument was that he was going to plow his car into the crowds leaving a Justin Bieber concert in Cardiff. Autism rights advocates have argued that he was an example of a vulnerable person who was radicalized, who was trialed as an adult. He was only 17 at the time. So it's clear that there's a disconnect between our criminal justice system, the autistic community, and what's happening online. So 49% of terrorism arrests in the year September 2022 were linked to suspected extreme right-wing terrorism. The official figures also show that the largest increase in terrorism-related arrests were those aged between 18 and 20. It's clear that teenagers are being radicalised. And if you go to any school in the whole UK and you bring up a man's name, a man we'll talk about in a second, we can see how this is happening. So we can map it out. We can view in real time, when looking at teenagers who are neurodivergent, how this happens. It starts quite easily. Um, we're looking at alt-right and manosphere connections most commonly. We're looking at people who aren't overtly hateful, people like Stephen Crowder or Ben Shapiro. These neurodivergent communities assemble around figureheads. So we'll look at somebody in a second. We'll look at Andrew Tate in a second because he is the most famous man in Britain at the moment. Uh, more than the king, I would say. Um, but regardless, what happens is you get a neurodivergent community of fans that build around figureheads. And we'll look at the reasons why my community is so susceptible to these messages in a second. So this is Andrew Tate. Uh, I'm assuming a level of familiarity with Andrew Tate. I don't know how famous he is in America or if it's comparable to his level of fame in the UK. Um but it's quite remarkable how famous he is in the UK now. It's rare you turn on the news and Andrew Tate's name isn't mentioned at least once an hour. So the Manosphere as a whole is a loosely collective movement online of a number of groups. We'll look at some of the notable ones in a minute because they're notable for autism. Um, and Andrew Tate has become a figurehead for the British disenfranchised youth. So what I mean by that is... I think it's important that we try and put our mindset into that of a young autistic person. Now, we know teenagers rebel. It's an inevitable concept of being a teenager. The first time you ever spray paint a wall and you realize you can leave an indelible mark on the world you live in, that's an important moment for a teenager. And teenagers rebel out of control, a lack of control. Well, autistic people's lives are uniquely controlled. We don't have real life friend groups. The vast majority of autistic interactions occur online. The example I always give is I didn't have an in real life friend until I was 17. But that's not to say I didn't have any friends. I would spend every hour of the day talking to people online about my special interests. But what happened is these areas of special interest, these groups that I would go into, became extreme. Very much so. What happened is, is edgy jokes turned into racism, turned into homophobia and transphobia. The example I always give is there was a forum I went on every single day of my entire life from the age of about 11 to 16. Now, for this interview, for this role, I went on the forum and the fourth post was about buying women. So in the space of 10 years, however long it's been, wait, how old am I? 15 years. In the space of 15 years, we've gone from this Zelda game is really fun. I really like the new Mario Kart to is it easier to buy women from Eastern Europe or Southeast Asia? Which one is more subservient? Now, this is not uncommon. And when I talk to other autistic people and their experiences of being online, we say the same thing. A coworker of mine is autistic. And he said to me the other day, do people really need this training? Don't they know? Don't they know that this is what happens when you get autistic people online, that it devolves into this? It doesn't always. I can give you some examples of groups that it doesn't. Uh, the speed running community would be a really good example. Um, but unfortunately, this appears to be a pattern. 
And when we're looking at academics uh, who have viewed this research uh, or have done research on incel groups and the manosphere as a whole and online misogyny movements, neurodivergence keeps reoccurring again and again and again. Now, Andrew Tate is unique in the UK because of our government. So there's a quote here from the Guardian article from last month, and it says, Teachers are being advised by the government not to discuss Andrew Tate, despite the fact that schools are reporting a rising tide of misogyny and sexual harassment from boys as young as nine. It's rife. And this is irrespective of whether it's private school, state school, it doesn't matter. This is rife in the UK. There's a number of reasons we can look at why, um, but it's important to understand the manosphere and the grip the number one thing I struggle with in my training, and I spend half an hour of a two hour session doing this, is the scope of this. It's much wider than I think we realize it is. The most listened to human being in the entire planet is Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan has consistently been broiled in anti-Semitic, racist, transphobic scandals, whether he is or isn't, is sort of irrespective. It's clear that these massive, massive influences have a degree of influence over our youth, particularly our autistic youth. Half of young people, oh, oh, I'll pause, I'll pause the take clip. Um, half of young people polled by Hope Not Hate said they had a positive view of Andrew Tate. And more young people have heard of Tate than Rishi Sunak. Rishi Sunak is the current British Prime Minister, for those unfamiliar. His influence is boundless. Um, I do have a Tate clip here um, that I can show for those of you who aren't familiar with Tate. As a word of warning, it will contain swear words and misogynistic language, but I always think it's important that I show you just how influential these people are and the kind of like typical rhetoric we can hear from them. You need to unshare and reshare because you need to click on the share the audio of the yeah. So, so just to understand, is that a, a TikTok video that's on YouTube? Okay, I think you're muted. I no, I don't hear you. Sorry. I am muted. You're right. Uh -oh. It's on YouTube. <laughs> okay. Um, share sound. I've got it. I've got it. Right, okay. This is a YouTube clip. So Andrew Tate's particularly nefarious when we're thinking about monetizing media. So what he's done is he gets his fans from around the world and he has millions of fans. There's no doubt about this. And he gets them to take clips of him speaking. The man is incredibly prolific. He'll speak for six, seven hours a day. He take They take clips of him speaking and upload them to TikTok, Instagram reels, YouTube shorts. And then Half of the revenue the clip earns goes to Andrew, and half of them goes to the person that uploads it. He has deliberately created a way to propagate his message. And when we're looking at organized hate groups, propagating a message by the followers is one of the first things we look at when people have been radicalized. Glitch in what way? In the sense that women don't feel like they need men in the most physical sense, perhaps yeah, like right. naturally. It's, it's very interesting. Women don't feel like they need men in a physical sense because life is soft. And it's bullshit because you still need men by proxy, one. And two, the second life gets difficult. Glitch in what way? In the sense that you still need men by proxy, one, and two, the second life gets difficult, you very quickly learn how much you need men. But women will go, I'm an independent, I don't need no man because I have an OnlyFans and men bear my OnlyFans and if anyone comes up to me, I'll call a male police officer, I don't need men. Shut up. Of course you do. Mm -hmm. You just named your whole life, it's based on fucking men. The road you're driving on was paved by a man. The house you're living in was built by a man. The car you're driving was, was designed by a man. Your whole life depends on men. And the second anything bad were to happen to you, the second you were physically threatened, or times were to get hard, or war were to start, or famine, or or riots, the first thing you do is find a big strong man, shit yourself, and throw the feminism out the window. Mm. Feminism goes out the fucking window the second that the snow needs shoveling, or there's a fucking broken down car, or the tire needs changing, then all that crap vanishes. It's garbage. Wonderful. Um, so we can see the sort of rhetoric that our young people are interacting with, and when we think about the vulnerabilities of autistic people, because we are a vulnerable community, I'll, I'll show you some of the reasons I think later and there are a number of reasons why we're already particularly vulnerable to any form of messaging like this but the group i want to have a look at there's two groups i want to have a look at in particular when we're speaking about the manosphere the first of those is the incel movement 
Now, the incel movement stands for involuntarily celibate. Incels believe that due to some characteristic they cannot change, whether their their height or how ugly they are or how poor they are, it's normally a physical characteristic that they cannot obtain a relationship with a woman. Some of them believe that governments should provide women for them, and they believe in a concept called hypergamy. Um, hypergamy is thrown around a lot on the internet as a dog whistle. And the concept of hypergamy per- pergamy is that 80% of women fight over the top 20% of men. So they believe that women marry men of greater social standing or financial standing or whatever it might be. They only date men to gain up in society. Um, I was talking to Dr. Debbie Ging from Dublin City University. Um, she will be the second episode of our podcast after my my interview with Yonti. And, and she said that the vast majorities of incels on incel.is self-identify as neurodivergent. Incel.is is the largest incel website in the world. Hundreds of thousands of incels interact on there every day. And she said that she's observed in real time hundreds of conversations revolving autism. If we think about the issues surrounding internalized ableism and autism, if we think about the issues surrounding HSP, which we'll talk about later, um, it's probably much higher than the vast majority. I would speculate that it's almost everyone who identifies as an incel is autistic, and it makes perfect sense why we're uniquely vulnerable. You're given a panacea. I often say with autistic people, we exist in a world that's not made for us. I cannot understand a myriad of communication errors and things that happen every single day. I work at a charity that supports neurodivergent people, and I've still made three of my co-workers cry. And I still, to this day, do not understand how those interactions happened, because it's difficult for me. You know, those social interactions are things that I struggle with constantly. I'm always going to come off as, as kind of weird or aloof, I suppose. Um, but given a panacea for the reasons you feel those way that feel that way it's women's fault very very easy message it's 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 a fascinatingly simple scapegoat it's women have it easier than men it's absolutely women's fault that's that's the arguments that they make and giving a sense of community often for the first time ever for autistic people there's nothing quite like it giving a certifiable reason and people you can empathize with There's a concept called uh, double empathy theory that posits that autistic people have no issue communicating. They have an issue communicating with neurotypical people. If you've ever been in a playground with two autistic children, they will find each other. You can watch them. They'll run off and then in 10 minutes later, they'll find each other. And we don't really know why. Um, But having that community that they empathize with is incredibly powerful. The flip side of this is the MGTOW movement. MGTOW stands for men going their own way. And the MGTOW movement believe that pursuing a relationship with a woman is a waste of time. They believe that feminism is destroying society. And that's a rhetoric you're going to hear a lot. This advocating for traditional gender roles and that kind of rhetoric. Now, this manosphere and alt-right directly leads to the far right. We can see it happen. Uh, This is Liverpool. This is outside St. George's Hall in Liverpool. It was in the Batman movie, if anyone saw the Batman, uh, Matt Reeves' Batman movie. Um, It was in that. Um, Liverpool is the most left-wing city in the UK. It has been for over 100 years now. And we still have a massive issue here with anti-Islam movement. So migrant hunting activity has increased by 102% in the UK from 2021 to 2022. Um, The Conservative government with which we have currently had, we've currently had a Conservative government rule for 12 years, 13 years. Um, At the moment, the two big issues that they appear to be ramping up are trans people and immigration. Um, Our current uh, Home Secretary said that we should take all immigrants and put them on a boat and send them to Rwanda. So it's clear that these fires are being stoked you know, without tipping my own political hand. Um, how does it happen? So in the same way, one doesn't sign up for a cult. You don't walk into a cult shop and pick up a cult book. 
you become radicalized over time. You go to a church, you go to a self-help group, whatever it might be. Exactly the same thing is happening here. We can see, um, for lack of a better word, extremists specifically target vulnerable individuals and target autistic communities. When we're talking about these neurodivergent communities, we're speaking about things that we often have a special interest. Video games, sports, anime, history, politics, those special interests that tend to be where we congregate. And, and there, there are some fascinating studies where they've observed Discord servers or Reddit pages go from normal discussions, like I was talking about the farm I went on, to becoming these um these groups of hatred there's some warning signs to look out for i'm going to skip past this so why autistic people that's the big question what what separates us from neurotypical people when we're looking at uh, ways in which we can be radicalized we have an inability to discern nefarious intent it's the same reason autistic women are three times more likely to be sexually assaulted than a neurotypical woman we get ourselves in situations of which we cannot see happening, where a neurotypical person would look at it and go, this is wrong, this is dodgy, we'll just, we'll just follow. It's just the way we are. We're often very socially isolated. We are. Um, we have difficulty with social communication, understanding social cues. And we have an innate desire for structure and routine, cause and effect, this sort of logic logic facts and logic we've heard this rhetoric used many times by the alt-right and it appeals to autistic people in a very specific way that they're giving us a book and we can look at a rule and go that's why this happens when we're looking at sort of degrees that autistic people take we tend to choose things that have definitive answers engineering science maths physics we like an answer um i chose social sciences just because i didn't want to be uh want to fit in with everyone else clearly i wanted to be the black sheep um but that, that tends to be the way it is and we have a tendency towards obsessive interests and fixations i could tell you absolutely everything about persona 5 i could tell you everything about video games yeah that's that's my obsession that's my special interest now sometimes this special interest and fixation can become extremism and then i believe that's what happened with lloyd gunton who i spoke about earlier where he's become radicalized online. He's been sought out by these vulnerable groups. I was talking to a man who's a, a public researcher in the UK. He works for a neurodivergent charity. And um, they're currently conducting research on pedophile hunters online. I don't know if any of you have ever seen these people online that specifically hunt out and look for, for pedophiles online. Uh, and they posit that over 70% of those that they found were autistic. And they're not actually pedophiles. It's a fascinating piece of research that will go live in the next couple of months, but I think it shows that how groups online are, are looking for us. And we're not that hard to find. We're not invisible. We're a community in free fall, is the honest truth. Autistic people are more likely to be LGBTQ. I am. We're more likely to not identify with ge traditional gender or heterosexuality or these traditional norms that we get placed in. Um... This is entirely uh, propagated by the fact that we're still looking at a world where only 25% of autistic people diagnosed are women. Many people still believe that autism is a boy's disease or a boy's condition, which is something I've heard firsthand, unfortunately, from uh, educators in the past. There are issues at the moment in the autistic community from internalized ableism. That's the biggest issue. That's the enemy at the moment. I read somewhere the other day that an ADHD child by the age of 10 has been told off more than 10,000 times more than a neurotypical child. The way in which we discuss disability is broken. We focus on what people can't do rather than them as a whole. And the way autism is discussed still to this day is as a deficit. And this leads into the other major issue with autistic adults, which is pushing us towards radicalism, which is employment rates. Um, we are currently the least employed largest disabled group in, in the UK. Uh, our employment rate is around 22%. Um, the UK has a massively high employment rate right now. There's jobs everywhere. It's a job market, everyone says, in the UK. Thousands and thousands of jobs. Um, we're not employable. We're just not, for a variety of factors. Um, 
And then there's issues with a lack of diagnosis. It takes four years to get a diagnosis. If you're an autistic child and you're different and you feel different and you know you're different, everyone's telling you off all the time. You're not quite sure of what's going on or what's happening. Then being groomed is such an easy solution. It's it's inevitable. It's waiting to happen because the things, the checks and balances that should be in place are not there anymore. And and the last thing really is that there's no autistic co community. There's no cohesive autistic community. When we're thinking about other vulnerable minorities and marginalized groups, there tends to be a strong sense of community or there has been in the past. There isn't one for autism. We tend to fight each other at quite a rapid rate. The other um, online group that I'm particularly interested in autistic people is the lol cow group which are people that find other mostly autistic people online to bully um, it's, it's clear that for some reason we just seem to be propagating this sort of hate autistic people are not in any way shape or form any more inclined to, to terroristic activity or radicalization than a neurotypical person but we are more vulnerable. And the issue is that saying this is controversial. That's the honest truth. This is a controversial thing to teach and discuss. There are some academics that would argue that because there is no link between far-right Islam and autism, um, there is no autistic terrorism. There are academics that will tell you that incels are not autistic. Um, because they don't often all have diagnosis, failing to understand the difficulties with diagnosis. So there's clearly a massive gap in deficit. And from an academic perspective, there is no cohesive view of neurodivergence and radicalism. There isn't any. There's never been one. And that's astounding to me. Because when you speak to incel experts, when you speak to online hate experts, they always say, yeah, there's definitely a link with neurodivergence. It comes up all the time. No one's ever talked about it. And I find that such an astonishing thing. And it's still quite a controversial thing um, to say this. Some people will take what you're saying out of context and will say that you're claiming that autistic people are terrorists or that we all want to blow ourselves up. We all want to hurt people, but not looking at the truth, which is that we're a vulnerable group that is not being cared for that there is no checks and balances in. And that's the biggest difficulty. I'd love to be able to say to you now, and we could do this intervention scheme and use this media literacy framework. But when we're even looking at the success rate of an intervention, we do not view it under the guise of a neurotypical, of a neurodivergent person. I was listening to Dr. Nancy Doyle, Doyle of Birkbeck University the other day, and she said that... Um, when you are uh, making an intervention, like a behavioral intervention, if you will, for a child, you measure the success of it based on how neurotypical the child behaves at the end of it. So there's, there's clearly a, a sort of fundamental failing in the way in which we're discussing them. Um, that's it. That's everything I've got, Yonzi. I hope that's okay. So, oh, I mean, again, I consider myself, you know, uh, somewhat knowledgeable, but so many like new things to to learn from what you just discussed. And I know I wanted us to to go to breakout room, but I think there's enough people here um, to ask questions. And I think there's so many fascinating things that you shared that I'm sure there's a lot of people that have a lot of questions for you. So the first, I, I'll start with one question and then I invite everybody to write questions in the chat and then We'll, we'll go one by one and have a discussion about it. But the first thing, I understand that the way that we uh, interpret the results of an intervention are problematic and ableist instead of like really looking at the population that has been doing the intervention. But can you share with us the work that you're doing with the media literacy intervention? What are the technique or what are the things that um, you're doing? We are not funded to deliver interventions. Mm, okay. We are only funded to deliver training, the trainer sessions, where we go to schools and we train them um, to create a cohesive media literacy guide to a media literacy framework, if you will, um, to create these interventions would take. It would have to be person centered. We would have to it would take time and money. Um, 
So from a media literacy perspective, from an intervention perspective, it's not something that we can do. All I can do is show them signs to look out for, explain how the media that they're interacting with online is affecting them and can be radicalizing them, um, and, and then leave it up to them. The government will not let teachers talk about these issues in classroom. Yep. The government has advised both of the large teaching unions not to talk about Andrew Tate. And um, I think that's uh, an interesting opening for our scholars here to really think about maybe that's an avenue that we can, as a joint collaboration, uh, and maybe the US and the UK. Um, so uh, here we have a question for from uh, Bozena Jelusic um, from Montenegro, a person who introduced mediator in school curriculum. Ah, she's introducing herself. Oh, she's introducing I, I don't know herself. if uh, Bozena, do you want? Do you have a questions? Do you want to to ask uh, something? Well, I begin to to write it. My question is about spectrum of autism in those research, since it could be from very serious, uh, let's say, damage uh, to those who are not so serious. And uh, um, I would like to know something about borders in that spectrum. Okay, so traditionally, um, when we were looking at autism diagnosis, people who were high-functioning autistic were diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which I'm sure is a term many of us are familiar with. Um, Asperger's syndrome doesn't exist. Uh, it, it never existed. <laughs> it was a, a bizarre diagnosis. It was a diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder that may or may not display characteristics that may or may not be present in other forms of autism. Um, so that's, that's a really difficult thing because you've got people who are autistic, who were diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, who don't want to acknowledge themselves as autistic. And those people refer to themselves as HSPs or highly sensitive people. But your question was about borders. So how are we defining levels of autism? Um, the truth is that at the moment, we're not. Um, autistic spectrum condition is the diagnosis for everybody who has an autistic spectrum condition. Um, that is not my area of expertise, so I can't judge it whether that's an appropriate thing or not. Um, it's a very difficult thing. So what happens is you tend to get people uh, using language like severe autism or nonverbal autism would be a characteristic. So we tend to identify characteristics outside of autism, uh, moderate learning disability um, or um, that, that that's uh, essentially if they have some form of intellectual impairment um, or you know nonverbal autistic if they, if they like speech but there is no current border everybody gets the same diagnosis irrespective so related to that thank you ali uh, you can stop sharing now that we're doing discussions oh. we can oh, see each other because i think some are not seeing the, the camera so i, I do have a two a couple final slides Ah uh, um, yeah so like please. final <laughs> i have final thoughts um which is sort of the future of the program um the funding for safety net runs out in 2024 um ofcom will not provide any further literacy media literacy funding um the current government have disavowed pshe lessons focusing on misogyny and will not implement wide scale interventions the shadow government who are currently in the polls uh, so likely to win you can no longer gamble on our next election um have said that it will be a major focus of their education the shadow education minister has said we will have pshe interventions based on the issues surrounding young people and misogyny um but yes so i've decided i need to pursue this <laughs> that's the honest truth um i'm currently looking at phd funding if anyone knows anywhere that is offering any form of funding whatsoever um to do empirical long term research at looking at the effects of um autism and radicalization um send me an email um i'll i'll put my email down in a second you know um i would move anywhere in the entire world for this irrespective of where it is um, because I think if, if I didn't do it, no one will do it. But yes, we can move on to questions now. Yeah, well, if you need connection with um, Simon Baron Cohen, let me know. I can connect you to him. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. <laughs> Not too much to to move to Cambridge, right? Um, so my, my big question is about the spectrum, not about the uh, spectrum of uh, extremism, actually. So you've been talking about the far right, but what about the far left? Um, 
is there any like look at that because like in the us there's a lot of discussion that you know depending on the perspective and depending on the media outlet uh each media outlet will talk about the other like side extremism uh but i was wondering because you mentioned only the the right but i'm wondering about the left as well so britain isn't a I can't remember what the terminology is. Is it bipartisan country? Um, the, the way the Americans seem to politicize everything, it's either Dems or the GOP. We're not really that way as a country. Um, it's partly because both our political parties are centrist. Um, it's rather bland. They argue over a very, very small amount. Um, there is no research on radical leftism. Radical leftism represents an incredibly small amount of extremism in the UK. Um, when we're talking about terrorism or radicalization in the UK, you big you have what we call the big three: far right terrorism, we have um, radical Islam, so so extremist Islam, and then we have Irish Republican terrorism. So for those of you that aren't aware of the troubles, Britain had terror terror incidents for about. 26 years between 1996 from about 1970 onwards. Uh, my parents' bookshop was blown up by the IRA, actually in Manchester. Um, when I was about one or two, um, it was blown up. So when we're looking at terrorism, they're the big three. Um, there are inherent issues around extremism and autism. And I think it would be fascinating to look at things like extreme vegans who are autistic or extreme animal rights activists who were autistic, because there's clearly, clearly a link there. There's no research on it. There's none. Um, but I think that's a great point, Jan. Yes. Um, I often say extremism brings breeds extremism. Um, but that's just I'm very centrist. I'm very British about that, I suppose. Um, but yeah. So um, and those sort of concentrated far left uh, um movements, like um, some people would argue Antifa. Or some people would argue um, Extinction Rebellion or communism as a concept. Yeah, they don't really, no, not in Britain. That's not okay. a thing in Britain. It's, <laughs> okay. It's just not, not really. Um, it doesn't really align with the way we are as a people. Okay, interesting. So I think, I think we, we, interesting. We, we already kind of like map like three different research that need to happen here. So uh, <laughs> that's my career. Um, so um, a lot of our audiences currently here, but also that will watch this video later on are educators. So we're talking about, you know, elementary, secondary, um, uh, even at the university level. And I'm wondering from your perspective uh, as an individual with autism, but also with the advocacy that you do, what is your request for educators? Um, and I know it's a vast, like I'm not, I'm not talking about two this, hours of lecture. Well, my of my, like, my no, degree is education. <laughs> um, I mean, do you mean for autism or for radicalization or? Both. Like, you know, I mean, you were talking about the ableism kind of like a uh, length uh, or, or lens that people are using. So is there something like as a message that you can give what would be in a doable way? Like, obviously there's, you know, a lot of things that we want to change, but what can they people do in their own classroom? listen to us. I think that's the single fundamental biggest flaw when it comes to autism. When we're looking at autism experts, they're not autistic. When we look at disability rights advocates, they're disabled. But overwhelmingly, autistic people are not listened to. Education itself is a horrible field for autistic people to work into. And there's some really interesting research around that. Um, I lasted about three years. Um, <laughs> but I mean, just listen to us and try not to focus on the negatives. And I know that can be easy if we're disruptive. But just because something's different doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. And I think it's important that we try and, and disengage from the way that we view things as a society. Um, if a child needs to wear a different jumper to school, that's fine. So in the UK, that's an issue. Like you have to go in an hour and a half meeting with the school board and the parents of the child to change the jumper because the texture's wrong. But to an autistic person, that's the single most important thing in the world. Um, I once had an autistic student who had sand in his shoe. I knew that we had to stop and he had to take the sand out the shoe because otherwise it couldn't happen. Um, the teacher I was with tried to chastise him for this, for taking his shoes off in class, and I had to explain. So fundamentally, it would just be listen to us, read, 
read up and read things written by us. That's the single most important thing. And not the curious incident of the case of the dog in the night. Don't listen to autistic parents. <laughs> While well-meaning, sometimes they're not always correct. Um, Bob Van Oosterhout, I hope that's okay, a pronunciation, um, wrote, please comment on the potential for building communities that support people who are designated as autistic. I would love, I would love a community for us. I would love a space that was safe for us to be how we want to be. Um, there are none. There are currently none. The potential is vast. Vast. There are sensory cafes and there are special needs schools. But fundamentally, um, there are no communities. So the potential is vast. It would be fascinating to look at autistic friendly communities online because we can look at communities that pre-exist who are autism friendly. I always use the speed running community as an example for this. Uh, this is a Speedrunners are people that play video games and try and finish them as fast as possible, like a race. People spend hundreds of hours, thousands of hours playing the same game over and over and over again. The speedrunning community, the vast majority is autistic and they are extremely inclusive. LGBTQ, trans, race, religion, age, it doesn't seem to matter. So there are these communities, but there aren't them focused on autism specifically. A lot of autistic people feel very isolated. Um, so, the, I mean, the potential's vast. I don't know what it would look like. I don't know if we need an app that no one else is allowed on that has muted colours. I don't know what it would look like. Um, but it's problematic, but it's right? Like, if you do even a closed Facebook group, how do you know that the person who is coming and wanting to join this closed, safe group is actually autistic? Like, there's no vetting, kind of, and it's good that there's none, I definitely don't advocate for that, but oh, that's well, no. the problematic way of like, you know, online communities. How do you really make sure that it's safe? That makes it like so difficult. Like, uh, but it sounds like at least you have one example that work. And I, I do. There are some, uh, there are some in there. Uh, you're, you're, is a fanta fantastic example. I can think of to what you're saying, Yonti, and that's the hashtag on Twitter autistic. So the hashtag aut uh, autistic on Twitter isn't used by us. It's used by parents of autistic people or people that work with autistic people. We have our own hashtag, which is hashtag actually autistic, because there was a sense that it was taken away from us. Um, so you're absolutely correct. You're 100 percent correct. There is a um, stop sharing. Um, there is a. Um, there is there is a difficulty with that and i often say um that if we all had pink eyes if all autistic people had pink eyes it would be the easiest thing in the world and it wouldn't be a problem but we're yeah, still living in a world I would go there, but... yeah. Yeah, we're still living in a world where people do situational judgment tests for interviews you know um and requesting that there isn't one as an autistic person is considered an unreasonable request um so it is living in a world that's not made for us, unfortunately. I want to make my comment and then I want to hear from Bob because I know Bob has a lot to say on that topic. Uh, when you were mentioning about listening to us as people with autism, I find it as somebody who doesn't have autism but work a lot with people who do have it, the um, online uh, vlogging have been super helpful for me. So there is now media production by autistic people that are sharing like their own stories that it's so much better to hear the voice and and to know than I mean also research is valuable and I'm using research I've done research but those um like media production on YouTube or podcast are so valuable like the work that you're doing specifically is is amazing and I'm looking forward to hearing the the podcast series but that was just you know to put there in the comment and Bob, I know that um, you might have more more comments than just asking about the community, so I want to give you time to to ask a question. Um, yeah, I've been trying to formulate it. Um, this brings back a memory of a program uh, that I worked with for eight years in the '90s called the Hard Times Cafe, and we probably had out of maybe an average of forty to sixty people um, at the weekly meetings and were involved with the day to day activities. Um, probably had at least a half a dozen who would fit the label of autistic. Um, and 
the, the focus on the community, what, what really struck me uh, that Alistair mentioned or Ali mentioned was the statement, we exist in a world that's not made for us. And I've used that uh, not only with people with that diagnosis and counseling, but so, and, and, and so much of our world is not made for so many of us. And so there needs, one of the goals of the Hard Times Cafe actually was to help the other people in the community learn to see us clearly, to see, I wasn't part of them, but to see the people in poverty who joined the program. And the essence of the program was that, that everyone was responsible for the whole program. Uh, it was built on, on recognizing the interests and potential of the individual and the value that everyone had something to offer. And all decisions were made by consensus. And I was the facilitator, but I had no authority whatsoever. So I don't know if that offers a model or if I'm happy to share information about that. I've got tons of, of stuff on that, no research or anything like that. But we, uh, we ran it for eight and a half years or yeah, over eight years actually. And uh, I've got some videos on it on my website. <clears throat> but it seems like there are two, two directions that, that we need to go in. And one is to develop communities where people can be themselves and recognize their, their gifts and potential and feel accepted and have a sense of belonging. And the other is educating the larger, the larger communities. Um, I mean, not the whole world at once, but our own community that we live in is this is what's going on. And, and just using the term, I always say people who are designated as autistic or defined as autistic, we're all just human beings and we all have unique characteristics. And if, if we can just simply recognize that and accept ourselves where, where we are, uh, but the problem is, is fear creeps in and fear creates an adversarial process and turns us against each other and creates a sense of blame because that gives us a sense of power and control. And so if we can transcend the fear and build some kind of a community and a communication process to be able to, to help people just simply see clearly with a more open heart, I mean, that, that's the essential process as I understand it. Wonderful. I'd, I'd love I'd love to have a look at some of the, those, uh, those videos and, and information regarding the Hard Times Cafe. Yeah, there's just one video on my website, uh, bringtruthtofear.org. Um, I think it's listed under empowerment under videos and blogs. And I have a, a, a lot of tapes. We did a, a number of, the way I paid for my salary, it was a nonprofit and we didn't have, so I paid for my salary by uh, doing training for social workers in empowerment. So we developed, I developed a model of empowerment and then the patrons of the Hard Times Cafe would come and we would put on a workshop for, you know, 80 to 100 people and bring in enough money to pay my salary for the next few months. We're out on our money, we do another workshop. So I have a number of, of videos on, on VCR tape of those. Uh, I could probably get them get them transferred, but there is one that was transferred then that I've uploaded to the website. So, and that's one of the, the longer ones early in the program, but it'll give you a sense of what we did. And I think if not, I can post it. Uh, we have, a, I wrote a training manual uh, for the people who tried to uh, take over the role of facilitator, but never really understood it. And so it, it kind of fell apart after that. So, um, but there is a training ma manual that I'll, I'll make sure is posted uh, to my website uh, in the very near future. Happy awesome. to share that. Yeah, please Thank contact you so me. If you love. Yeah. I can connect it to the to this like uh, webinar webpage with the recording that will be posted in several days. So we oh. can also put that there, you okay. know, resources. But I do believe seeing the attendance and the engagement, this is a topic that we need to inquire even more. Like, obviously, I'm biased because I've been doing that for like 10 years and I, I want to continue. But I see that, you know, I'm not alone, which makes me happy that there is here a group that is interested and want to further that. Um, I um, We have five more minutes or four more minutes. I wonder if other people have any questions. Um, I want to share something before we close. Yanti, thanks for doing this. It's Barbara Harrison from Ithaca. This is all new to me, but it now adds something new to my repertoire, so to speak. And it also, I think, not only about autistic people, 
but we need to be looking at people who are different than the norm and how we can work with them. We have, a, in, in the US, we have a big problem about crossing boundaries. You know, it's better to shun and just stick with our own than, than move, you know, ahead and create one whole, you know, group of people. So thanks for doing this. And thanks, um, Allie. I won't call you Alistair. <laughs> I don't wanna... it's, too, it's too British. <laughs> no, well, it's, you know, your mom calls it too. I know about those things. She you does. know you're in she trouble does. when they're calling exactly. you by the full name. That's exactly thank you, thank is. you, Barbara. Um, so here, April wrote, um, "Thank you, Ali. Uh, this was mind opening. As an educator, I have had many autistic students. However, I had no idea of these association they may join." Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the same with any form of vulnerable group. Um, we are susceptible to messages of hate, um, but we're particularly vulnerable. Uh, there needs to be a deft hand, I think, when dealing with us in a way that isn't patronizing, um, which is it's super difficult. It's super difficult. It's like uh, media representations of autism. It's incredibly difficult to get a good one because it is so divergent. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So again, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank sorry, you. Sorry. No, no, I appreciate it. And um, everybody, thank you for joining, Bob. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I just had a comment, um, and it, it goes back to to the label of autism. Um, everyone has something to offer. That's what we learned in the Hard Times Cafe. Everyone has, and, and surprising things we never would imagine people were able to do. And if we simple, simply focus on, or learn to focus, or help people to learn to focus on what someone's potential is and what their gifts are, instead of first looking at the limitations, um, the first I worked, my first job was working with uh, uh, profoundly mentally impaired men who had uh, problems with violence. And the director gave me some very, very wise advice that stayed with me a whole career. He said, don't try to stop them from doing anything. Focus on what you want them to do. Focus on what you want, who you want them to be. Okay. And, and that's really what I think sums up my understanding of, of what's really needed or one thing that, that's needed in this process. Thank you. And I think on this positive note and on knowing that this is just one out of uh, different initiative now that we'll try to think and collaborate on. Uh, again, Ali, I cannot thank you enough for reaching out and educating me and our community on the amazing work that you're doing and sharing that knowledge. Um, and for sure, I'm sure people will reach out to you, to me, and we'll figure out further collaboration. So you have um, Ali's email here in the chat. And those who are seeing the recording, please reach out um, to Ali or to me uh, if you have any comments. Thank you again for coming to another amazing webinar uh, of the Media Education Lab.